I know what a lot of you are thinking. Where has Michael Moore been on the Princess Kate story? Why hasn't he weighed in on this? He has a podcast. He has a substack. He owns a camera. He has a crew. Where, where, why the silence? Where have I been? Why am I not looking for Kate Middleton? All of that, right? And so I thought maybe the best thing to do today, because it's been such a miserable, pitiful week here in the United States of America and the upcoming election and what we're all faced with and yada, yada, yada. And of course, I will get to that uh, here. We're not going to spend a lot of time uh, talking today. It is, I'm recording this on St. Patrick's Day. And so I, I need to go celebrate my Irish uh, heritage. But I did want to speak to all of you for a few minutes about some things that have been going on. And uh, not the least of which is where is Princess Kate? Now, let me just, uh, when I was a, a young boy, the, the first books of a series of books that I started to read around first grade were The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And um, I really was into Sherlock Holmes. I love the way that he deduced things and sorted it out in some wacko, crazy way uh, where he used Dr. Watson as his uh, his straight man. And now there's going to be this new series uh, uh, on CBS starting, I think, first week of April called Elsbeth. And if you were uh, a viewer or a fan of The Good Wife and then the show called The Good Fight, these characters have run through these shows uh, that are produced by um, Robert and Michelle King, uh, the Kings. And uh, uh, they do really smart TV for network, network TV that's smart, things that you would watch. Um, and and so this Elizabeth character is, is she's sort of a a Sherlock Holmes on the spectrum, I guess maybe is a, a good way to put it. But it's they 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 did a preview of the pilot here last week, and uh, it was pretty pretty good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna watch this when it comes uh, when it starts here in another another week or so. But back to my Sherlock Holmes. Uh, fixation as a seven-year-old, eight-year-old. I've always, I've found this very helpful in making documentaries and uh, in my writings over the years that it's it's best, especially if you're in journalism, to always assume you're being lied to. It doesn't mean that you are, and it doesn't mean you have to be paranoid or whatever, but you should start from that position that, um, you know, how like we like to say in this country, you're innocent until proven guilty. Yeah. Uh, and too much of journalism is they just believe the official story. They believe the handout, the press release. And then serious, hard questions are never asked. No investigation is done anymore. There's there's so little money spent on actual news, especially electronic news, especially what we call television. Uh, it's, it's a dead and dying um, operation. And so we don't get a lot of that, what we, at least what I got when we were growing up, there were uh, journalists who really wanted to find out what the truth was and never accepted the official story that came from the spokesperson for the corporation or the government official standing behind a podium. Many of the good ones back then started with that basic concept that, well, everything that you're telling me right now it's probably not true. And I'm going to start there. And then I'm going to either make you prove to me that it's true before I report this to my audience. Or you're not. And then I'm going to prove that what you've been telling us is a bunch of BS. So in the case of Kate Middleton, uh, do we need some Sherlock Holmes music or something? 
mystery, like a, we're going to solve this mystery here in the next uh, two or three minutes. But um, the last time that there's been footage of or people say that they saw Princess Kate was at the Christmas service there with the royal family. But then sometime in, I don't know, was it January? The palace, the Buckingham Palace, announced that uh, the princess had checked into a hospital and had had abdominal surgery. To me, that's the first clue that somebody's yanking my leg. Abdominal surgery? What is abdominal surgery? <laughs> I mean, it's a location, a general location on the body where many surgeries take place, but when they do, they have a name. I have my appendix out. That's surgery in and around your abdomen. I have my gallbladder out. That's abdominal surgery. You say, oh, oh, his gallbladder was removed. Um, or you might have a hernia and they're going to go in and fix the hernia. Those are often in your abdomen area. Um, maybe there's a bullet wound. Maybe you were shot in the stomach. You know, that's will be some abdominal surgery. But there is no organ known as the abdomen. When there is surgery, right? And I'm, just, I'm not talking about just for famous people, but just within your family or your friends or your whatever, they tell you that they had a case of appendicitis and they took their appendix out and the, or the doctors took the gallbladder out or somebody shot them and they were stitched up or, you know, just go down the whole list of in the general area of, you know, if our body was Europe, this would be like central Europe, the abdomen, but it's a, it's a, it's a location. It's, it's not, it's not a body part. Now, I know, don't get technical on me here, medical students or, you know, uh, people that watch too many episodes of Grey's Anatomy. Um, you're going to send me things telling me that, oh, no, the abdomen <laughs> is a real thing. Um, oftentimes, I think when we're feeling like a pain or something in the abdomen, Basically, you just say, I, I got an upset stomach. You point to the stomach, the stomach. Now, all around the stomach are a whole bunch of other things like, you know, the, the, your colon, the, uh, the uh, large intestine, the small intestine, right? The, the kidneys are around there. So the liver is there, um, you know, all, all of this stuff. So why lie? Well, first of all, right out of the gate, why lie about the where of where she is and what is going on. And then she's, then she stays in the hospital for another, what, what was it? Two weeks at least, right? Nobody, has, has anybody been to the hospital lately? They want you out of there as soon as possible. I mean, you know, for all kinds of things, they actually don't even want you staying overnight. They'd like you to come in at six in the morning if there's some surgical procedure and have you out of there by five. Like one of the most important things you might go to the hospital for is bringing human life into the world, having a baby. Again, in by 10, out by six. The idea is not to have you spend any time in the hospital, partly because it's costly. It's costly to you, but the insurance company hates it. That's really who doesn't want to have to pay the bill. And the hospital doesn't want to try to collect it. It just has a whole bunch of problems. So they want you in and out when you go to the hospital now. And, and frankly, you want to get out of there um, because dying in the hospital because of something you picked up in the hospital, some infection, et cetera, et cetera, or a mistake that the hospital makes. I saw that it was like, it was just this month. They had a, a new report out that the number, like number three cause of death is, is you going to the hospital and something happening in the hospital 
or you picking up something in the hospital. It's not a safe place to be. Most doctors will tell you that. You do want to get in and out. There's at least 100,000 deaths a year caused by something that went wrong or some infection you pick up while you're in the hospital. She was in the hospital for like two or three weeks. Okay. You know, I know there are things why you would be in the hospital for a long time. A horrific car accident. Uh, You're in a coma. Um, (laughs) I'm not laughing. I'm just, I'm just saying what we all know to be the truth because we live in the real world. And that is uh, hospital stays are extremely short and they're not for abdominal surgeries. (laughs) So I guess, so, so that was number two. And then it just, it just, you know, I, I have not gone on to any of the conspiracy theory websites about this. And, and frankly, I don't, I don't really care. Is that bad to say on some level? I mean, I hope she hasn't been kidnapped. I hope she's still alive. Um, I'm certain that something is wrong. Something is wrong in her life. Something is wrong with something that's not in the abdomen. So I do, I mean, I, I, she's a human being. I, I'm not making light of this, but, um, with all the crap we've got going on right now in this country, around the world, um, you know, the mystery of princess Kate shouldn't even be taking up the amount of time I'm giving it here on today's podcast. But I just, I just, I know a lot of people in the Royal Royal family listen to this podcast. So I just want to say to you now, as you're listening to this, um, that everybody's on to you. Nobody believes you. Um, you know, men, cheaters, men who cheat on their wives. You know, I, we don't need to go into the statistics of of sadly a lot of boys grow up to emulate their fathers and end up doing things that their fathers did and a lot of men not all but who are sons of cheaters sadly end up being cheaters themselves now many men um don't do that in large part because their father was this way. And so they wanted to, when they became adults, make sure that they didn't behave like their fathers. So that is, I thought I'm an optimist about this. And I think most people want to have a good life without a lot of pain, um, attached to it. I don't need to spell this out. I think everybody just read between the lines of what I was saying in the particular case that we're investigating on today's podcast my new true crime podcast (laughs) find the missing royals with michael moore um but it should be okay and because they are important to a lot of people in the united kingdom and in maybe one or two of the commonwealth countries but you know when you start to get the little tells that things aren't right, it's okay to pay attention to them. And if you're a journalist, it's okay to ask questions. And I think one of the sad tells about Prince William, it seems that um, he hasn't treated his brother very well. And um, I read Harry's book. Wow. Um, I also watched their their documentary series and then the interviews with uh, Oprah. Now, I know you're saying, Mike, really? 
with everything that's going on. Yeah, but I'm a fast reader, and uh, and and I find I find uh, Megan and Harry to be interesting people that are trying to do good for the world. So, you know, I'm always for those of us who want to do good for the world and not feel so alone in doing it that there's other people that are doing it. And some of them, you know, might be a member of the royal family, even though they've been virtually kicked out of it. I guess they can't fully be kicked out of it because um, whatever the hereditary laws are in kingdoms, they uh, they maintain who they are. But I got to believe that um, their mother, their deceased mother, probably wouldn't be happy to see how her youngest boy has been treated. And generally, I don't know. When you see behaviors that, and even though this is all from a distance, we don't, we're not in their lives, thank God. But when you see certain behaviors that just don't seem very decent or kind, then I think, especially if you're a journalist, everything should be suspect about those kinds of people. So where is she? I don't know. Was that her in the car, in the car with her mother? I don't know. But anything you need to know about her mother and what her mother's role might be in this uh, can all be explained by watching uh, the just completed final season of The Crown. It was a uh, pretty brutal the way that Kate and her mother are first introduced in the in the story of the crown in this last season and um you know how much of it is true i don't know i mean this it's a work of fiction based on real life situations here but um you know come on you you who listen to my podcasts and read my stuff and watch my movies you're you're skeptical people not cynical but i didn't say cynical skeptical we should all be skeptical we should all question what we're being told we should always question authority and and if they can't get the things right the simple dumb shit stuff like the royals if they can't get that right and if they um allow to have the wool pulled over their eyes or they just like repeating things that aren't true that they haven't investigated but they repeat them as truth then i don't know if they really are giving us a lot of horse shit on inane stuff like where's the missing princess man we live in a dark time and we need our free press more than ever and we need journalists to do their jobs and you've already spent now what over two months longer on this princess nonsense to the point where i'm compelled to begin my podcast talking about this and not getting to the real issues of the day so i'll just stop right here because well my abdomen is starting to feel a little, I don't know. What is this I'm feeling in my abdomen? I, I, I'm going to need to take a quick break here before we uh, continue with, as I promised, this very short podcast. But um, um, why don't I, I'm just going to move to a, another undisclosed uh, room uh, here in the apartment. And, um, and why don't I, while I'm doing that, tell you about uh, today's underwriter, the good people that are, uh, funding uh, today's up episode of, of rumble with Michael Moore and Kate Middleton. Now, not everything has to be as unclear and mysterious as the current whereabouts of the Royals. For instance, if you're a small business owner or even a larger one, or maybe you have a school or a nonprofit or something like that, and you're trying to raise some money to have a living, and you want to share it with an audience without any hassle. 
then our underwriter for today's episode of Rumble, Shopify, is your answer. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, whether you're just getting started or you've been at it for decades. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Plus, Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success every step of the way. There's a reason that Shopify powers millions of entrepreneurs and small business and nonprofit people of every size across 175 countries, including 10% of all e-commerce in the United States. That's because businesses have found that the way to grow is to grow with Shopify. So sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash rumble and make sure the word rumble is all in lowercase, R-U-M-B-L-E. Go to shopify.com slash rumble now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash in lowercase now, rumble. And thank you, Shopify, for being there so that my voice is supported and heard by the audience out there. Much appreciation. Okay, let's talk about something else. This was just a weird week, and I just want to cover a couple of other things here uh, uh, for for uh, today. Just actually, just before I was going to start recording this yesterday, uh, another news bulletin came on my screen here saying that uh, another Boeing plane had a panel fly off the plane a, like an outside panel just you know, not, not another hole in the plane like a missing door or whatever but um but just another this is like what seven or eight things in the last two three weeks with boeing especially their 737 max planes it's like, if it is one thing, it's something else. And it seems a lot of them are on uh, either United. These incidents are either on United or Alaska Airlines. And then it comes out, and this is really, the, I think, probably the important news, is that the, the FAA demanded that a number of inspections take place on these 737s. Uh, what are called they're called audits and that Boeing failed 33 out of 89 uh, failed failed audits in other words didn't pass inspection they found other you know former doorways of the planes that they just turned into a window wall and then but there are missing bolts on more than one plane and and a whole bunch of other things that have been wrong. The big 787 last week, the it's their biggest plane, Boeing, the big jumbo jet called the Dreamliner, uh, just went into a nosedive because now they claim maybe a flight atten attendant bringing the meal into the pilot accidentally tripped the the thing that's you know like on your uh, your car seat. You have that little electronic button that can move the seat up closer to the wheel or back. That's what they're saying now happened to the pilot's chair. They hit the little button and he got crammed up to the wheel, which made the plane dive or so. I don't know, but it's like, this is, I mean, I'd rather just talk about the metaphor here for what this really represents about the United States of America right now, what we're going through, what 2024 is going to look like. One Boeing incident after another. The Palestinian people, a lot of people, when they get a little bit of electricity to charge up the battery on their phone or their tablet or their computer, they've been sending out actual footage of the slaughter so that that uh, we can't turn away because we don't really want to deal with this, do we? We don't want to think about how we're paying for it, do we? No. 
we don't want to think about this guy, Netanyahu. God, what a perfect... That's not, that's not like Yahoo isn't his last name. It, it's Netanyahu. That's his name. Benjamin is his first name. But I love the fact that his last name sort of is Yahoo. <laughs> and this week, Chuck Schumer, who, who has now been in all these stories, they refer to him as uh, the highest ranking Jewish government official in the United States because he is the uh, majority leader of the United States Senate, which the Democrats have one or two more senators than the Republicans. And um, uh, and he's Jewish. The, the point is, yes, is that Chuck Schumer uh, has been a huge supporter of Israel his entire uh, political career from the Upper West Side of New York, now is the New York one of New York's two senators, and he made a very brave, bold, almost shocking speech from the Senate floor here in the last week or so. That it took Biden a couple of days. Uh, they said Biden was informed that he was going to say this. Basically, that that. Uh, it took Biden a couple of days before he congratulated Schumer on saying what he said about Netanyahu, uh, that, that Israel needs to hold elections and they need to decide if they want to support what Netanyahu has been doing in terms of the mass slaughter of civilians uh, in Gaza, but that this, uh, this can't stand. He implied there should be at least a temporary ceasefire, which isn't good enough. And um, and he acknowledged that if the United States of America is giving you a bunch of weapons, A, you're not to use them on children, elderly people, civilians. And you're supposed to follow the Geneva Conventions, which say that, that um, if you are in control of something and if you're a participant in this bombing, for instance, uh, you have to allow humanitarian aid in to help save those who are the innocents. Please don't write me and tell me how no Palestinian is innocent. They're all the same. They're all behind Hamas. Uh, if they all could have gone over their prison fence that day, they would have. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, don't, don't, um, just follow the golden rule. Don't talk about people in the ways that other bigots talk about you. You know, this, this kind of bigotry that we all have fought for, well, most of my life, we won't tolerate it. So if you start sounding like that, which is said and done to you, um, you want to you want to treat others the way you want to be treated. That's right. The golden rule. So Schumer uh, did this again. It's not the speech I would have given. It's not as far as I think those of us who are uh, in support of peace, peace and uh, not the uh, extermination of people simply because they are Palestinian and that alone is reason enough to carpet bomb their cities just because or just because some people of that group did some horrific thing to you or your people or a country that you support therefore you have the right to kill everybody that looks like them or belongs to their religion no, we, we don't believe that. At least we say we don't. And unfortunately, the people that were on our government haven't pulled the plug on the madness. This thing can end. You know, I mean, it's, yes, and I've I've said everything I've had to say about Netanyahu and blah, 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 but we're the bank. We fund it. We supply the weapons. We supply the cover. 
And as long as we're the ones doing that, uh, the buck, no pun intended, really does stop. It starts with us and it should stop with us. So, you know, and this, the other thing, the week began last Sunday on the, uh, on the 10th. So this is now the 17th. Yeah. So the Oscars were last Sunday. It was a very powerful moment when a film called The Zone of Interest won for Best International Feature. It used to be called Best Foreign Film. And uh, the director uh, went up to the stage with his producers and made this incredible, incredible acceptance speech saying we are we are three men who stand here in front of you refuting our Jewishness. Refuting. It was like, what? Wow. This film is about, um, the zone of interest is about the quaint life that the commandant of Auschwitz lived just over the wall. So like, you know, 20 feet over the wall that surrounds Auschwitz where at least 1.2 million Jews were slaughtered uh, during the Holocaust during World War II. And yet on the other side of the wall, he's got his nice little family and the kids and the, the dogs and the gardens and Grandma comes by and everything. Oh, they go down and have a picnic by the river. And they, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, as I think I've mentioned this film in weeks past, it's one of the most incredible horror movies I've seen in some time and never shows any blood or, you know, what we're used to with horror or horror films. Uh, you see the occasional black smoke rising into the sky from whatever's going on on the other side of the wall there. Now you hear a few gunshots every now and then. You hear a few, a few distant screams. You see the teenage boys, you know, got a little collection of teeth, human teeth in a little box up in his bedroom. This film is brilliant. And they gave a brilliant acceptance speech saying that they don't want people to look at the film as just a piece of history, but we should look at this film in terms of what we're going through now and the horrors that we support. And they mentioned the occupation that's been going on now for quite some time, the Palestinian people. Um, in the occupied territories and the war that's going on. And of course, you know, they mentioned the, the horror, the absolute horror of October 7th when 1,200 Israelis uh, were slaughtered. It's, it, it, I, I will put up on my, on the site here on my page uh, for this podcast if you'd like to see their acceptance speech. So anyway, so yes, yeah, so all of this is still going on and um, which really leads me to um, probably the most important thing that I want to talk about here. And that's how a lot of you are feeling after this last week. Trump finally had uh, a, a few minor victories, maybe not so minor because the most important thing, the good news that he got from a couple of the courts this past week is is the thing he really wants to delay all trials so that no, no bad news no convictions before people vote that's his, that's been a, his plan obviously from the beginning because if he can postpone it if he can avoid handcuffs being put on him and taken out of the court after a guilty verdict for the criminal trials then he has a stands a chance in his mind, at least, of being president again. So I know a lot of you are feeling bad. I, 
I've read a lot of your comments online. I've read your emails that you've sent me. And, and I know I, in the first, you know, two, three years of the Biden administration, I have told you just not to worry, no matter what the polls are saying, you know, you've got to have a little faith in the majority of your fellow Americans. And <laughs> Trump is not going to be let back into the White House. And I've said that up until October. And when the carpet bombing started with our planes and our bombs and everything else, just this mass slaughter of innocent people. And then Biden going there, embracing Netanyahu, you know, the occasional criticism, but nothing ever really happens. The slaughter continues. And they started polling people and finding out that a young people, 70 to 80% of young people oppose President Biden and what he's been doing. That means a hell of a lot of, the, of them, they're not going to vote for Trump ever. So don't think that. But they may not vote. They are very upset and they're very angry, as they should be, as we all should be. But there's something funny about 18 to you know 26 year olds. Um, they're usually the ones sent off to war. They hate war the most because they're the pawns of war. They're the ones who come back dead when you, you know, enough convince enough Americans that Saddam Hussein had something to do with 9 11 or that he had weapons of mass destruction he was going to use on us. Well, who's going to go deal with that? Me? You? No. 18 to 26 year olds. And some older, because, you know, it's a volunteer army. So people sign up, people have careers. But they're also the people that want to make sure that we, the people, do not send them off to war unless it's absolutely necessary. And I mean, absolutely, where it has something to do with our actual defense to actually protect our lives and the lives of the people that we care about it should be all people, frankly. So so now we find, now we see in the polling that uh, young people, Biden is going to have less young people voting for him. They're mostly going to not vote or vote third party. And people of color, uh, his poll numbers are down with uh, Hispanic voters, with black voters, you know, not by a lot. There's still the, you know, majority uh, are for him and, and for obviously for, you know, the Democrats, but wow. And they're worried. They're very worried about it. You know, Biden purposely didn't campaign in Michigan before the Michigan primary last month because they were too afraid of protests people showing up to oppose his support of the killing in Gaza. They didn't want that on TV. He ventured into Michigan this week to do a little victory lap that he was taking of the blue states in the um, Great Lakes states. And uh, I thought, is he really going to go to Michigan? He went to Saginaw. Went to Saginaw, Michigan. Saginaw is like, you know, if Flint is like a mini version of Detroit, Saginaw is a mini version of Flint. It's about 35, 40 miles north of Flint, known as the uh, birthplace of um, uh, Draymond Green and little Stevie Wonder. He's not little anymore. He's just Stevie Wonder. But uh, but those are Saginaw's two great gifts to the world. So, yes, so, we're, so people are worried. People are worried that um, Biden may lose. Uh, you, I had 100,000 of my fellow Michiganders a couple of weeks ago voting uncommitted in the Democratic primary. 100,000 wouldn't vote for Biden. He, <laughs> The Democrats lost Michigan 
by just 10,000 votes back in 2016. Trump won Michigan by an average of two votes per precinct throughout the state. 10,000 votes. You got 100,000 in the primary that voted uncommitted. I mean, Biden, will, most of those people are going to vote for Biden. But we've shown how you can lose Michigan by just having 10,000 people sit it out. So it's a legitimate fear now that things may not go the way we want it to go, meaning Trump does not reenter the White House. So I understand why everybody's worried and concerned and nervous. And what I'm saying to you now is, uh, yeah, you should be. But I want to I want to give two reasons why that that we don't want to say this out loud, but I'm going to say it. And the reason why we need to be concerned is that Trump is smarter than us. I'll just let that sink in for a second. I know. I know you're calling the people that come to find me, the guys in the white, uh, the white uniforms with a, with a big net and take me away. <laughs> Are you crazy? What do you mean he's smarter than us? Well, not in all the ways you know that where he actually is quite dumber than us. Um, no, I'm talking about the way throughout his entire life he's been able to pull shit off and get away with it. It is an amazing record. You know the record. I'm not going to run through the whole litany of it since he was in his mid-20s. How he's never had to pay a price for any of his, uh, what do we call, <laughs> the variety of his behaviors, crimes, various things he did with his father, racist stuff, sexual assault, etc., etc. You know the whole list. And he's gotten away with it. And he, and he, he you, you must at least got to give him some, you must marvel at how somebody that stupid is that smart when it comes to the performance of his evil and his ability to never have to pay for it. And that's what you're sensing right now. It looks like he might actually pull off delaying every single one of these trials. We're talking at least four trials we're talking um, 91 indictments, which I think now got lowered by three. Another minor victory for him last week. Now it's uh, 88 indictments. I don't know. Those of you listening, have you ever been indicted? I've never been indicted. Or maybe I should ask it this way. Have you ever been indicted 88 times? Anybody out there right now listening who's facing four separate trials? And you're worried about what's going to happen in November because, A, you know he's going to at the very least be able to delay every single one of these trials. And you know that um, he's going to uh, be either found not guilty or there's going to be a hung jury or more crap like what's been going on in the Georgia courtroom is going to uh, be revealed. And his lawyers will file uh, more petitions to the court and just keep kicking this thing down the road. You know, I heard somebody say the other day on TV that um, if these trials ever re actually do happen, it'll be when, uh, what is Obama's daughter, the older one, Malia? It'll be when Malia Obama 
is running for uh, president. That's how long this thing's going to take. And um, while it was a funny, scary line, um, it was it had a foundation of truth to it, and you know it. He's gotten away. That's why he said that famous line. As soon as he said it, I thought, well, actually, if they put a lie detector on him saying that, I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and nothing would happen to me. He believes that. No, he really believes it. It's not just bravado or a dumbass talking. He believes it because that's the life he's lived from the, the most minor of offenses to committing an act of sexual assault and rape in the Bergdorf dressing rooms. He's gotten away with it every single time. So it's not, I'm not worried about my fellow Americans, the ones, you know, the 70 million or so that are going to vote for him. Because there's always going to be more people that are going to want to vote for the opposite of who he is. I still believe that. I know a lot of you, if your faith is kind of blown in when it comes to our fellow Americans. And yes, 70 million, that is a lot of people who would vote again for this individual after they've witnessed this behavior of his. Uh, for the last nine years, nine years since he came down the golden escalator. It'll be nine years here in June. Wow. Yeah, I know. We're weary. We are weary as hell. We're beaten down by this. We can't believe we're still having to look at him, listen to him, all that. But there he is. And like some strange magician he keeps pulling these things off to the point where you know and this is where now we really have to come in and do our part because you know in my closing uh soliloquy at the end of my last film fahrenheit eleven nine, where i state very clearly this is a few years ago now that uh, no special prosecutor is going to save us from Trump. Do you remember me saying this? No special prosecutor. Mueller isn't going to save us. The Democrats and their impeachment resolutions aren't going to save us. All the things that we think that where the system will save us or that our laws will save us or law enforcement will save us the Department of Justice will save us. No, my friends. The cavalry will not be there to save us. They're not riding in on horses to protect us from the evildoers like Trump. The only thing that can save us is ourselves. We are going to have to mobilize. We are going to have to um, get laws passed. You know, we can complain all we want about how lame the Democrats were for the 49 years after Roe v. Wade was decided and abortion was legal. They had 49 friggin' years, the Democrats, to get a law passed by both houses. And they did control both houses at various times in those 49 years but they were too afraid to really take it on. After all, it's, you know, it's just about women, the majority gender. They couldn't do it. And so, so when the Supreme Court finally got rid of Roe, we had nothing to fall back on unless your particular state uh, has enough good people in the legislatures that are going to protect women in those states. But these crazies are not done. These are extremists, my friends. I don't need, you don't need me to tell you this. Same-sex marriage is coming down the road here. 
elimination of that, birth control, various forms of birth control. They're not going away, these people. They're crazy. They're not going away. And so we then, because we're the majority, and the majority agree with us, whether it comes to pro-choice, the planet Earth, pick any issue, the majority are with us. So why haven't we mobilized, organized, and used used this great position we're in. We don't have to convince the majority that funding the uh, Israeli slaughter in Gaza is wrong. The majority already agree with us. The majority of Americans want an end to that war, that attack on the Palestinian people. When you pick any issue like that, the majority are with us. So why aren't we doing the work we need to do to mobilize our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, our classmates, our families? They're already with us. They already agree on these things. This is what we should be talking about. This is how we should be spending our time. Not sitting around waiting for a prosecutor in Atlanta to save us not going to happen sitting around waiting for a special prosecutor in the justice department going to save us not going to happen thinking that a trump appointed judge down in florida overseeing the uh top secret documents case is going to save us or thinking that well, we got him on that Stormy Daniels thing. That is, that's going to save us. No. If you're relying on that system that the media, our political leaders, our corporate leaders, all the people that have taught us to, to believe in the system, our great system is there for us. It will defend us. It'll protect us. Surely by now you don't need me to tell you to wake up. It is a constant lie machine that is foisted upon us on a daily basis. And either we're too tired to want to really discover or find out what the truth is, or we just want to stick our heads in the sand. We just want to be happy and have a good life and be optimistic. And it just can't be this bad. And Trump, Trump, tell me Trump's not coming back, Mike. It's the wrong question that we're asking. The right question is, what are we doing about it? We, us individually. First of all, just how are we climbing out of the rabbit holes that we're all in, that we've all, you know, scurried down into, uh, not wanting really to stick our heads up because we're sick of it. We're sick of it all. We're sick of looking at Trump. No, it's too bad. If you believe in this, if you believe that we should complete the democracy experiment that we started almost 250 years ago, started it and in, in, in a highly flawed way, insisting that women have no voice, black people have no voice, Native Americans have no voice, no say in any of this. Bit by bit, we've tried to fix it. Bit by bit, we've tried to complete the job. We can't, we haven't. We need to finish the job. You and I need to finish the job. And I'm telling you, friends of mine and me joining them uh, in like two and a half weeks, we got 100,000 people in Michigan to come out to the polls to send a message to President Biden that the slaughter must stop, the funding of it must stop. 
And these are, we're all people that voted for Biden. Most of these, most of the people I knew that were in that group, getting people out there last month, Michigan primary. These are Biden supporters or former supporters. We did that in two and a half, uh, maybe three weeks with little or no money. We organized it, got the national media's attention. They were forced to have to cover it to the extent that they did, but it was just enough where people knew, wow, I could go to the polls and I could, I could send a message to the president of the United States, a strong message. And because it's a primary, I'm not really hurting the possibility of him staying in the White House if he does the right thing, but I'm also not helping Donald Trump. All that was made understood and possible. And the next week, the people of Minnesota came out by seven percentage points higher than the number of people in Michigan came out and voted on their ballot there. What was, called, what was their uncommitted line to send a message to Biden? And if other states had that, more people would be doing it right now. Because why? Because the vast majority of Americans agree that the killing must stop in Gaza, period. We have to be the ones to stop this. So please don't ask me if, if Trump's going to win. The person that knows the answer to that question is you. And I don't mean you and your fear button or you and your sense of horror that you have every time you see Donald Trump on the screen. I'm talking about the you that knows the power that you hold because you represent the majority of Americans, the majority of Americans who believe in women's rights, the majority of Americans who are against war, the majority of Americans who are against the destruction of this planet, the majority of Americans that b b believe that whatever old people are getting on social security comes nowhere near what they need. You are the majority. You believe in universal health care, real universal health care. All the things that you care about, the majority of Americans agree with you. So what's what are we waiting for? What's the hold up here? Don't wait for me either. I'm just I'm one person. I've got a little microphone here, you know, but I, I know, I know what you're, I, yes, I do have about 10 million social media followers. I have tens of millions of downloads of this podcast since we started it. Um, so I know the privilege I have of being able to have this, this pulpit, uh, this, this platform by which to reach millions and millions of people. And I will do that and continue to do it. But you can come up with some good ideas too. And you and do them locally, do them in your neighborhood, do them at work, do them in your church, do them wherever. Do it for St. Patrick's Day or the day after St. Patrick's Day. Please you can answer your own question about whether or not Trump's coming back to the White House. But the answer can't be in just words. It has to be in deeds and actions. I'll pick this up again um, next week. By then, I will find Princess Kate. I'll leave you with that. I'll make that promise to you. Um, I'm going to do my best to unravel what has happened here. And by the way, now some about a half hour later, here, my abdomen is feeling much better. So um, I think I'll be good to go. 
and uh, we'll find out what happened to the Princess of Wales in our next edition of True Rumble with Michael Moore. My thanks uh, to our executive producer, uh, Angela Vargos, and to our wonderful editor and good friend, Donald Bornstein, uh, for uh, taking care of today's podcast for me. Uh, and to all of you who listen and share this with others, uh, thank you for that. And uh, we'll talk to you very soon. This is Michael Moore, and this is Rumble.